Hello, everyone, and welcome to this seventh European RICS World Built Environment Forum webinar, which today is in partnership with Glodom, as well as ASIT, our lead tech partner. My name is Sander Schurwater, and today's webinar we will be discussing how EU sustainable finance policies are impacting the construction and real estate sector, a very pertinent and timely topic. Um, the obvious starting point of this is to give an overview on what, uh, in between brackets, EU sustainable finance policies actually are, uh, because a lot has been happening in recent years, but also very recently. And I'll just name a few examples. Um, I think one milestone uh, was with the start of the new commission, which was the European Green Deal, which was announced on the 11th of December 2019 where then new EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen stated that the aspiration for the EU is to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Now let's put aside for a minute how climate neutral is defined and how progress is actually measured. It is a bold but probably needed statement. Um, the Green Deal revolves around creating a clean and circular economy. Uh, it's linked to a green post-COVID or let's say post-vaccination recovery uh, and to reduce emissions also not only be neutral by 2050 but to reduce by 55% by 2030. Then there is uh, familiar to many of you I think the EU taxonomy and related taxonomy regulation which was published in June of last year 2020. Uh, these are about a classification system, uh, basically establishing a list of environmentally sustainable economic activities aimed to enable sustainable investment. Uh, and these include the real estate and construction sectors. Already since 2013, there has been EU legislation on so-called non-financial reporting, which requires large companies to disclose information on the way they operate and manage social and environmental challenges. On the 21st of April of this year, so just a few months ago, the European Commission adopted a proposal for a Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSR Directive. And this forthcoming directive should be complemented by EU sustainability reporting standards. On the 6th of July, so just last week, the EU Commission published the EU Sustainable Finance Strategy, which aims to bring together the EU taxonomy, so the classification framework, with a system of disclosures, so the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation and the already mentioned CSR Directive. And also the third thing, the tools to provide the solution, such as a EU climate bench, very relevant for our first speaker or a few other speakers, a standard for European green bonds. Now there is also a circular economy action plan, a regulation for establishing the framework of achieving climate neutrality, energy performance of buildings directive and also EU levels which was presented during our last webinar and is an assessment and reporting framework providing a common language for the sustainability performance of buildings. And if all of this is not enough for you, tomorrow the European Commission is set to present its what they call its Fit for 55 climate package, uh, which is apparently going to consist of no less than 13 one, three legislative proposals, uh, either updates to existing ones or new proposals. And they're very much aimed at the EU's 2030 goals of cutting the emissions by 55%. Um, I'm also sure I've missed a few along the way, but I think this is already a lot. So yeah, moving on, I think my main question for this webinar is, uh, are you seeing the forest through the trees? Picture that I've taken myself, beautiful forest nearby of where I live. Um, I have to admit that I don't, but over the next hour though, what I do have is an excellent panel, of which I'm very happy they accepted to speak here who can hopefully shed some light into the EU's sustainability forest and specifically how financial policies are helping or hindering advancing sustainability in the built environment and specifically in the fields where they work. Uh, the panel combines a lot of experience in the financial sector uh, in both construction and real estate from a bonds perspective, banking and investor, as well as a speaker uh, who acts in an advisory capacity towards both the public and the private sector. So. With that said, I will now introduce the panel in the order in which they will speak. Uh, and I would like to invite all of you to quickly say hi when I've introduced you. Uh, if for nothing else, we know that the connection is still working. So first speaking, we have Sean Kidney, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative, which is an international organization aiming to mobilize the $100 trillion bond market for climate change solutions. Uh, Sean will set the scene for us and provide an overview of where we currently stand when it comes to our climate, emissions and actions. So welcome, Sean. 
Hey, I'm here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Next, Jennifer Johnson, Deputy Secretary General of the European Mortgage Federation, which is the voice of Europe's mortgage industry. Jen developed in recent years and which in my opinion is not just following EU legislative developments but actually has also been one of the main steers and drivers so welcome Jenny. Thank you Sander happy to be here. Thank you. Third Olivier Olivier Elamin, Chief Executive at Austria Office, a German-based REIT. Um, Olivier is not only representing his company but also EPRA, the European Public Real Estate Association, where he's in and Olivier will give us the investor viewpoint uh, with a specific focus on the need for investor stewardship. So welcome, Olivier. Thanks. Happy to be there. Thank you. And finally, Ella Etienne Denois, CEO of Green Solace, a Paris-based innovative consulting firm dedicated to enabling the rise of more sustainable, smarter and user-centric real estate and helping private and public organizations to make sustainability happen. Um, Ella has played a central role to a recent study on ESG trends in real estate investment, which she has undertaken together with organizations such as APRA, but also INREF and the IPF. And she will share with us some of the highlights of that study. So welcome, Ella. Happy to have you. Thanks, Sandra. Happy to be here. Thank you. So before I give the floor to Sean, uh, just a word to all of you listening. Uh, with over 300 registrations in over 40 countries, we are very happy uh, to have all of you here. And we also welcome your active involvement. Now, of course, because of the, the number of people, uh, you are all on mute, but you have the possibility to submit questions through the chat function, which you uh, through the question box, which you should see on your screen. And I'll be picking up as many as I can through the session, time permitting, uh, if any of your questions are not answered, we will discuss with the panelists how we can uh, give you the answers uh, through the World Built Environment Forum website and summary after the webinar. So with that said, and without further ado, Sean, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sandra. So uh, I've, um, I'm going to give a bit of a scene setting and then look about, at the European and uh, some of the steps taken by regulators and governments other countries also to support a shift in this market we all know the basics we need to get about a roughly a 40 percent reduction in emissions out of the built environment to achieve our paris agreement 1.5 degree targets the the commitment to those targets has been bolstered recently first we had 112 countries i think it is now committing to net zero by uh, 2050 which is an incredible change since uh, the last time I looked at the beginning of uh, uh, 2020 when we had about three countries. Also, we've seen in the last few months a dramatic ramp up in support for the necessary 2030 targets that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change talked about in 2018 and has been reiterated by a variety of climate science, science commentators. We need to get global emissions down on average by 55%. All the world's major economies have now made substantive commitments to 2030. Is that enough? Not quite. Some are 47%, some are 45%, the UK 68%, the EU 55%, and so on. But it's absolutely an extraordinary advance. And the focus on 2030 is exactly correct. In a webinar I was doing this morning in Japan, there was a lot of discussion about utilities and, and industry in Japan is taking 2050 target import, uh, seriously, but they're all talking about shifting after 2030. In other words, uh, they will get to the planning in the next few years and they will start taking action in 2030s. The 2030 target makes it very clear we can't afford to wait 10 years before acting. We have to act within the next nine or eight and a half years. And so that's a big ramp up. And of course, that means action on the built environment becomes all the more important because that's a way of depressing emissions quickly to aid the rapid transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. It's also a way of addressing a really big problem that's occurred in the past uh, eight years, which is the, the increasing energy demands of air conditioning have kept pace or exceeded the energy being produced by clean energy, by renewable energy sources. We have not actually gone forward despite a massive growth renewable energy 
because of our increased air conditioning need, partly related to climate change. If you've been looking at the heat spots in Western USA and Canada uh, this week and in the past few weeks, a lot of air conditioning demand there. So we've got some work to do. Energy efficient buildings, heat efficient, as well as cold efficient, is an absolutely critical part of this transition. So where have we got to so far? Well, one thing we have done is we've managed to grow a green bond market, which is about $1.4 trillion outstanding, which is fantastic. It's grown from nothing a few years ago to a substantive uh, position now. Of course, the global bond market is still 100 trillion. We've got a long way to go in doing this. Mind you, more than, more than half of that is sovereign issuance. So it's not doing too badly. A lot of that is property, but not enough. About 140 billion of green labeled bonds relate to the to green property or energy efficient property using a variety of criteria um, over the past few years. Now, given that property assets are two thirds of hard assets on the planet, once we exclude derivatives and, and so on, we've got a long way to go because we need to be converting the investment in property globally to investment in green property. And there's a question of how we do that. Well, the first step is we need to know what is green. That's a challenge which we're trying to address in the European Union taxonomy and of course in the climate bonds taxonomy and various other related activities. And then we've got to look at preferencing of that market. How do we introduce bias towards energy efficient buildings? This is what we've been doing in Europe lately. Uh, so first, let me take you to the taxonomy. On the back of the green bonds market, which has essentially convinced people there's opportunity in energy efficient, green, climate related finance, if we can, for capital markets, we've we've managed to grow this idea that clear rules will benefit and grow the market. Commoditized rule sets, a feature of financial markets is commoditization of rules to, before they can grow. There are some intrinsic benefits of bringing in a capital markets angle to what has generally been, I'm gonna call it a cost benefit argument around energy bills. In the words of one, manager of one of the world's largest ESCOs that I spoke to a couple of years ago, who was telling me that for years, at ESCOs, energy services companies, for years he'd been trying to convince the property funds that he worked for to allow him to do energy efficient measures across their building portfolios with return on investment periods of between three and five years. You would have thought that's a pretty good investment. The challenge, he said, was that in many cases they didn't make the benefit that the budget uh, gains were for the tenants, not for the uh, landhold. This is the principal agent problem you will be familiar with. Or in other cases, the benefits weren't substantial. That is substantial in the context of the budgets they were spending. Of course, there are some com companies like Bonardo in the US or Investor in, in Australia who have been making a feature of being green anyway as a way of attracting tenants but they're still not, the dom still not dominant. However, when he could take make a case to the treasurer of a real estate trust, that not only would there be cost savings over time, or at least zero, zero cost because of the return on investment, um, but also the initiatives that the ESCO was going to take would allow the treasurer to then issue preferential capital into the green bond market, the discussion changed immediately and suddenly, the treasurer was absolutely interested and was very quickly, very quickly willing to start signing off on initiatives. So you can sort of see how this theory of change idea works. In, in this theory of change discussion about how we shift appreciation of property, there has also been a discussion about a best in class versus a really good market. People often say in Europe, you know, don't we want to go straight to zero carbon buildings? Ideally, we should but we also want to create value for being very energy efficient, which if we go straight to a zero carbon measure, well, let's say there's a handful of buildings in each country that will qualify, so it doesn't quite take a market. So in developing criteria at the club at bonds level and now at the European taxonomy level, we have largely taken an approach of what I call best in class with a tightening threshold. In the European taxonomy, for existing buildings, you can call a building and of course financing or inst financial instruments related to that building, sustainable or green, 
if the building fits the top 15% of performance in terms of energy efficiency in any single market. There's some work to identify those buildings that will that will all happen in the next few months uh, using proxies and so on, but that's essentially the idea. However, that 15% becomes a hard energy efficiency or emissions measure within three years, which is the next review period, and then at least every three years it tightens. That it gets tougher and tougher till we get to net zero by 2050. This is what's called a contraction and a convergence model. Every single market, despite the relative differences in their stock, starts off with a best in class set at 15% for that market, Bucharest, Copenhagen, Dublin, and they improve on a path towards a vanishing point at the end. So that's the central underpinning of the market. So in the European Union taxonomy, which is a guidance for financial markets that will be governed by regulators, and for our purposes is really importantly linked to disclosure, mandatory disclosure requirements for all investors, banks, and corporations in Europe going forward, supervisor regulators, that is, that is disclosure on the sustainable investments, not just the high carbon side, um, there are three measures that count. First, if the building is the top 15%, as I've just described, that building or the financial linkage to that building can be disclosed or counted towards green bonds. If a retrofit of a shopping centre, say, achieves a 30% improvement on baseline, then the retrofit expenditure can be counted. Not the whole building, unless you vault the quality of the building at the top 15%. And then finally, for new build, the baseline is the near zero energy building standard that Europe is the process of rolling out. You have to do 10% better than that. We actually recommended 20% to the technical expert group last year. The commissioner settled at 10%. My hunch is that won't last a long time, but I'll be interested to hear views on that. There's a fourth category, which is that we've also allowed what's called a whitelist of investments that are deemed to be positive, come what may. If you put in triple glazed windows into a home or, or you do solar roof shading, that counts. No matter whether the rest of the house, the house or building improves its energy efficiency or not. So there's a select list of what called whitelist ingredients which qualify. The embedded carbon is not addressed. We exclude that issue. In other words, it's around the envelope of the asset. You can't green a building by buying green energy under the European taxonomy rules. They're the essences of it. On the back of this, we are hoping, expecting, a significant growth in the green property bond market. And we have been working closely with folks like the European Mortgage Federation and the European Council of uh, uh, European Carbon Bond Council on linking up with their energy efficiency mortgage label so that we can have all of those banks who signed up to that beginning to promote these criteria out to their constituent lenders or lendees, I should say. Note that in the green bond market, we already have benefit. In Europe, there is tangible price benefit for green bond issuance backed by these standards already. In the European Action Plan on Sustainable Finance announcement last week and the various other announcements that have come through, a range of other measures are beginning to, uh, to be rolled out. The Commission has talked about risk weighting benefits in the capital ratio requirements of banks. Hungary is trialling this already. That will be focused, as it is in Hungary, on property related green bonds initially. That is, a bank get gets a better capital ratio if it owns green bonds as portfolio. We've seen a rolling out a green bond standard that will be a regulatory oversight for this mechanism. And of course, the European Central Bank, not only do we have climate stress testing on one side, we have now have an active conversation supported most notably by Jens Weidmann of the Bundesbank in a speech a few weeks ago that look to consider green quantitative easing, linking quantitative easing purchasing programs to bonds that meet the taxonomy requirement. So you can see how incentives are coming to play and how this will not create a market. Hey, it's well and truly there, folks. It will turbocharge a market and drive transition. There's work to be done. Of course, there's work to be done on property regulation, on guidance about 
what run out of energy efficiency measures to install in different sectors and how to disincentivize, as the Dutch central bank has done, finance to energy inefficient buildings. There's a lot more work to be done, but this looks like a very good start. Back to you, Sanders. Thank you, Sean. That was a great start and wealth of information. I've, I've taken many notes. Uh, I think what I especially take away is, is, is your valid points on that we can't wait for 10 years uh, to plan and then to execute. So, so having a 2030 goal is good, which it is. Uh, I do sometimes think politicians get reelected every four to five years. So intermediate milestones towards 2030 might actually not be that bad as well. Uh, really blown away by, by your comment that um, the increase in AC capacity globally is exceeding the, the increased supply of renewable energy, which is sort of telling not only how we design buildings, but also how we use buildings and how we use our energy. We, we can get all the clean energy and the clean buildings that we want if, if, if our consumption of energy, whether it's for ACs or anything else, uh, is exceeding that. We're, we're not really solving anything. I, I think maybe just a short question because I, I also liked your sentence uh, what you said about uh, going towards preferencing the market toward it towards the right way thinking of the title of this webinar what you know about it do you think that current EU legislation and the proposals are driving this sufficiently or are there other tools like subsidies etc that, that that we should take into consideration we should be doing everything we possibly can the nature of the crisis facing us is existential for our societies, our economies, and frankly, for the lives of our children. So I'm not going to ever say that any government is doing enough until climate change is not a threat to our existence. So I've got to say that. Having said that, I think that the European uh, initiatives of this year, the last week, in fact, and of the last couple of years, have been fantastic in upping the game about government action leadership on this space. So the so really it's a superb step forward and there's clear European global leadership involved. But you know, there is a lot more to be done. And I think Sanders, all of us around the table today will have lots of thoughts about further steps that should be taken immediately, need to be taken immediately in a democracy like Europe is we're going to need to bring everyone with us. We've got to run these arguments in Poland, in Slovenia, in Sweden, not just in France and Spain and, and Ireland. And that's our challenge to, let's call it, make it easier for the Commission to push through the kind of measures we all know we need. Yeah, thank you and agree. Uh, thank you again. So moving on, Jenny, um, can you please share with us what you European Mortgage Federation has been doing in the field of green mortgages in the past few years and how this has been led or how it has led the development of EU sustainable finance policies. Sure, thank you, Sandra. And thanks again for the invitation to be here. So over the next um, few minutes, I'll, I'll sketch a little bit our energy efficient mortgage initiative journey, which began in 2015. And I'll outline some of the key touch points with the EU sustainable finance agenda. And actually, Sandra, I'm really grateful that you pointed to our achievements in this area, because for as much as we're trying to respond to the EU's transition objectives, we have, and I say this in all modesty, um, really driven the agenda in relation to energy efficient mortgages. Um, back at a time when sustainable finance was not a thing, and it was kind of unheard of really, at least the buzzword in Brussels. Um, and so what we're seeing today, developments that we're seeing today in, 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 in our area really were unthinkable, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, so thanks for that. And then I'll say a few words about what the future holds for us um, in our view. Um, so without further ado, essentially um, for the last six years and by way of three EU funded projects, we have been working on what now I've mentioned um, as being our energy efficient mortgages initiative. Now, the idea of the initiative is to catalyze a new integrated multi-stakeholder energy efficient mortgage ecosystem, um, which is basically intended to support the improvement of the EU's aging building stock. Our initiative is built on cooperation and dialogue between finance, industry, academia, and public authorities. And I'd really like to say, again, a big thank you to RICS for having been with us from the very beginning of this journey back in 2015. Also to Sean and the Climate Bonds Initiative, who have been great supporters and continue to, to support our work today. Um, 
about the journey, I mean, at the heart of a successful energy efficient mortgage ecosystem um, is a virtuous circle, which basically brings together the right products, providers and services with the ultimate aim of delivering the right financing and retrofitting solutions to the EU's households and businesses. Now, what we came quickly to realise was that in addition to banks almost having a moral obligation to support the financing of the climate transition, it actually could make business sense for banks to do so. And the reason for this is that building energy efficiency can impact a bank's credit risk. With the more energy efficient a building being, the lower the credit risk for the bank and therefore the lower amount of capital that banks have to hold against the underlying mortgages. And it's basically this correlation that drives the business case and in turn, the virtuous circle where all of the actors in the chain get a benefit um, with the ultimate, obviously, benefit being um, supporting the climate objectives of the, of the EU. Um, and what is more is that, of course, this business case and this virtuous circle is independent from public grants and subsidies, et cetera, because, of course, we know what the limits are of public, public financing. Now, once this realisation became clear, a key priority of the initiative, alongside efforts to, de to define what we meant by any, an energy efficient mortgage and to describe the product framework and accompanying components, and here Rick's played a very important role, one of the key priorities has been to gather empirical evidence in order to communicate the business case to the market through clear data from reliable sources. And this basically triggered two important processes. The first one was that we set about designing an infrastructure to manage the collection, processing and disclosure of data on energy efficient mortgages. Um, and alongside a master template for banks to collect data internally and organize that data, one of the most recent um, outcomes, and Sean already mentioned this, um, has been the energy efficient mortgage label and its disclosure template. And basically together, the label and the HDT, as we refer to it, will serve as a transparency and kind of quality benchmark for the market. It will help banks to evidence compliance with regulatory reporting requirements. And if we're thinking about the full value chain, it will also support um, investor due, dil due diligence. The second important process was that we conducted in-depth data collection and analysis exercises in Belgium, the Netherlands, and most recently in Italy, which have together delivered strong evidence that the more energy efficient a building is, the lower the credit risk for the bank. And this is what I referred to earlier on. Um, and this pioneering re research, if I may call it that, has since triggered similar analysis in the UK, as well as further elaboration of the um, Dutch analysis, which, and this is really interesting, indicates that this relationship has a greater impact in relative terms on borrowers with less disposable income. So here we're getting some insights into how energy efficient mortgages could actually play an important role in fighting energy poverty. Um, research is underway in other markets, and so I would say watch this space. Now, and this is where, referring particularly to the, the energy efficient mortgage label and our correlation analysis, I'd like to kind of, if I can, describe a little bit the, the touch points between the energy efficient mortgage initiative and the EU policy initiatives in the area of sustainable finance, climate and energy policy. So first and foremost, and through our efforts to mobilise the mortgage industry, the initiative, or the Energy Efficient Mortgage Initiative, has or is a direct and concrete response to the EU Green Deal and the Renovation Waste Strategy. So basically, we're focusing on unlocking the EU's energy saving potential through private finance and trying in this way, of course, as we all are, to guarantee the tr transition towards climate neutrality by 2050. Um, furthermore, um, the initiative is an important bridge between policy ambition on the one hand and market reality on the other. Um, and the energy efficient mortgage label in particular will support implementation in the market of the EU taxonomy's building criteria, which um, of course uh, Sean has mentioned at length, and incidentally which we were very engaged on, uh, on as well. And essentially the label will provide a mechanism for banks to align to the requirements of the EU taxonomy over time to demonstrate portfolio eligibility and basically to deliver transparency and best practice at European and global levels. Um, and in turn, this will help banks to fulfil and disclose their green asset ratio, which of course is another hallmark of the, the wider sustainable finance package. Um, and finally, here on the EU agenda, um, as the link between climate risk and financial stability has has become increasingly recognised, the European institutions are turning their attention to how ESG risks should be addressed from a supervisory perspective. 
um, in the context of risk management and the capital framework. And again, in all modesty, I think this has something to do with, with, with the work that we've been doing, the correlation analysis that we've delivered. Um, and again, the energy efficient mortgage label will support banks in meeting increasingly stringent and detailed disclosure requirements. So I've sketched the big lines here with regards to the important touch points between the, the sustainable finance agenda and our initiative, but I'd also like to point to the very direct and clear reference to energy efficient mortgages in last week's sustainable finance strategy um, with quite significant and comprehensive efforts planned to promote energy efficient mortgages and also plans to bring forward the European Banking Authority's work to assess the potential for a different prudential treatment for these mortgages from 2025 to 2023. And again, um, I think this is very much a recognition of this potential um, to, to realign the prudential framework as a result of this, this correlation um, that we've been able to evidence. Looking to the future, I think these two developments um, in, in last week's sustainable finance strategy um, are developments which, as I said almost at the beginning, were unimaginable six years ago. Um, and we really hope that together or taking, taking all of these aspects together, um, the, the, the sustainable finance strategy will deliver a favourable legislative environment that will complement our own, on, our own um, ongoing efforts. Um, also to scale up actions at local level through national hubs across the EU um, and together you know efforts at EU level our own efforts so bringing together top-down and bottom-up efforts we can boost energy efficient mortgages and really set the course for the financing of energy re retrofits for the years to come and so that's our ambition and, and we remain as ever as we were at the beginning we remain today absolutely committed to this um, and we really look forward to uh, to trying to deliver on our on our promises Sander, I'm happy to hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Great overview. I mean, as I said at the start, what I really like about this project is how you, you're not following the legislation, but you're working together. You're working together with the EU, with the Commission, with the European Banking Authority, and it's about achieving common goals. Uh, so not just waiting for legislation, but actually supporting it, driving it, you know, as you to put it in your words, to unlock the energy saving potential by unlocking finance. So. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on to Olivier. So, Olivier, can you please give us your views on the role of policy for both the real estate and the investment sectors? Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm really happy. Um, happy to do that, and and also probably um, I would like to apologize in advance for providing or painting maybe a, a different picture than the one we heard before. Uh, but but this is really, I think, the reality which is grounded in real world. Um, that I think it's also important to to bring forward. Um, so if if we move um, not necessarily to the first slide yeah, to the first slide, uh, for those of you who actually didn't have the chance to read the 700 pages of the taxonomy and the different annexes, the EU have produced something which is very very useful, uh, which is called the EU taxonomy compass. And what that did, what that does, it allow you to basically um, research for very specific keyword within the taxonomy. And then figure out, you know, what has been defined as uh, being sustainable. And what is really, really amazing is the real estate industry has managed to do something unbelievable: is that you can actually be green without doing anything. And that actually is the only industry that has this opportunity right now. Uh, you can just buy something, and then you are taxonomy compliant. Which, if you think about it, is really interesting. We're speaking about reducing CO2 emission in the atmosphere. We're speaking about reducing emission all over the place. But here, the only thing you need to do is just spend money. And that's also interesting because when you speak to people who were involved in those conversations, it's actually because, you know, you need to increase the amount of green finance and real estate is an easy way to do that. So, you know, putting money at work for buying and owning existing buildings, which by definition are not physically doing anything on the ground, is actually considered as a as a good thing from an environment perspective. On the other hand, if you want to buy a building and then retrofit it, as was mentioned by by Sean, that do not comply for with the taxonomy. The only thing that comply is actually the amount you're going to spend. So the taxonomy here is not rewarding somebody who is actually doing something in order to improve the situation, but it's rewarding somebody who is spending a lot of money on already existing project. And that obviously has a, an interesting number of consequences. If we go to the next slide, 
under the taxonomy today, I can use cement and concrete, which is 8% of global emission. I can mix that up with steel, which is 5% of global emission. And by mixing two of the dirtiest processes that we have on Earth to produce carbon, I will produce a 100% taxonomy compliant asset because embodied emission is completely disregarded. Embodied emission is actually the core emission in real estate going forward and is a core problem that we have. I mean, arguably that a new green building is taxonomy compliant or is helping the environment to decarbonize is the equivalent of Ponzi scheme in finance. It's exactly the same thing. You're financing future savings with uh, current emission, which are substantially higher. There's now a number of academic studies that actually highlight that the vast majority of the emission in the lifetime of a building are done through um, the construction phase. And, and just to be complete on that, because I don't want to be caught into just telling half the truth, in actual fact, the taxonomy would ask you to do a life cycle assessment and which you need to disclose to somebody who buy it. But the result of the life cycle assessment, to a certain extent, is almost irrelevant in the classification of the building. What's also interesting is cement itself is a regulated um, is a regulated activity. So producing cement, which is again very, very polluting, is a regulated entity and there are rules about how you produce cement. But producing concrete, which is actually the end product of cement itself, is not regulated. So you can ask, you can use again a very clean cement, but put a lot of it into concrete, and then you're going to produce green concrete uh, by using very, very dirty cement. So that's, I think, the second point I wanted to make, which is again only in real estate. And obviously, when you do those things, there are consequences. And Sean has spoken about those consequences. And obviously, he, I mean, we have a different take on those consequences. If we go on the next slide, the, the consequences is obviously money is pouring into real estate. Because when everybody wants to look green and to be green, 85% uh, of the respondents in the Climate Bond Initiative uh, survey say they want to invest in buildings. And buildings is a substantial part of the of the green bond markets uh, obviously because it's so easy i mean this is the opportunity to basically green yourself without doing anything and this is done with the blessing of the eu and the taxonomy so why wouldn't you do that uh, so a lot of money is going into a product which is actually not helping by any bit to improve the situation and that again is is done uh, at a wide scale uh, under the, the current framework of the European Union. If we move to the next slide, let's create, I think, a very interesting situation. Because if you look at the recent study by the CS Center of Global Real Estate in Georgetown University, they came to the conclusion that, first of all, from a company perspective, there is no empirical evidence that green bond uh, improve your cost of capital. They also show that, I mean, it's uh, real green bonds are not helping to reduce carbon within buildings. But what's even more interesting is they came to the conclusion that the reason why company issue green bond, and as a company who is or will issue green bond, I can confirm that, the only benefit of that is the signaling impact. There is more value in signaling that you're doing something than in actually doing it. And the reason for that is, and anybody who is on the ground, is that unlike what we've been told, um, it's not an opportunity. It's actually, there is a lot of costs that need to go in there. If this was a massive opportunity, then we wouldn't be here discussing it. If this was an opportunity, you know, we would be rushing into it and there would be no problem to start with. So this is not an opportunity. This is about managing past liability and there are going to be a massive cost invested in it. And in order to manage those costs efficiently, we would need to make sure capital goes where it needs to go and where it's more efficiently used. Currently, if you invest one euro in a green bond, you're gonna be 81%, 81 time less efficient, not 81%, so 108,100% uh, less efficient than if you were to invest the same amount in renewable. Again, investing in green bonds into buildings and pretending that this is making things better is like arguing that I give happy meals every evening to my kids, and that's great for them because they always get a gift with it. It's the same kind of comparison that you're making here. If we move to the next slide, 
I think it's clear for me that you don't solve a 100-year crisis with a five-year bond. You don't even do that with a 10-year bond. What is needed here is equity. What is needed is money that's going to allow us to solve um, a problem that we have been creating over years. What you need is to retire a lot of existing infrastructure and put new infrastructure in place. And that's the reason why we're speaking about subsidies. That's the reason why we have taxonomy, because nobody at this stage is willing to support the cost or willing to discuss that openly. But when you are on the ground, this is exactly the conversation that you're having. Is should we basically invest now and, and potentially lose money in that investment? Or should we just keep on doing what it's allowed by law and, and then continue uh, business as usual? And it's obviously a difficult question to ask because there is the lack of leadership at the level of the EU, which is not giving a sense of direction uh, and, and is not, for instance, imposing a real strong carbon tax on, on us. At the time where interest rates are close to 0%, at the time where company can finance themselves at literally no cost right now in the capital market, and that has nothing to do uh, with, the, with the climate change problem, it cannot be that this lack of financing that is uh, kind of stopping us from moving forward. There is something else, and unless we accept to look that into that, unless we accept that reality, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to find a, val a valuable solution to the problem. At the end of the day, if we keep on moving to the next slide, please. Um, and there's some information missing on, on that slide for whatever reason I'm not showing. But it's not about data. We don't lack data. We know basically what information we need to have. We know where the problem are. We know how they're created. We have a pretty decent view about how things are working. When I had the conversation about including embodied carbon in the taxonomy in Brussels, I was told we cannot do that because we don't have enough data about embodied carbon emission. And, and that's, that's, that's a ridiculous answer because in actual fact, we know exactly or round about plus minus 20% how much embodied carbon there is in the building and, and we don't need to have more specific data. It's not about reporting. I mean, there is a lot of reporting which is happening today and doing more and more reporting is not gonna help us solve the problem. It's also not about performance uh, for that matter. It's about stewardship. And stewardship is about understanding, from my perspective, and this is something which is supported by UNPRI and where, on which the, the European Union have said, and, and this is really uh, the, the kind of light uh, that there is in, in this kind of dark cave we're in right now. Uh, so the European Union says they're going to be looking into it. It's about reviewing the fiduciary duty concept. It's about reviewing um, and understanding that it's an interlinked system, that everything is linked to everything else, and that if you do not act at your level, then there are going to be consequences at a more broader systemic level. And from an investor perspective, as a company, we need them to help us with stewardship, to, to tell us what to do and what not to do. And the dialogue needs to work both ways. It needs to work between companies who, who need to tell investor, this is what we're able to do in our field. And investor need to go back and say, this is what we want you to do because we have a global view on what's happening across multiple sector and across multiple jurisdiction. And, and I, I do strongly believe that it's only through that process that eventually uh, we're gonna have a more uh, and a better capital allocation mechanism uh, that's going to help us uh, through all of that. I think I'm I'm at the end of the presentation. There is actually a lot of more information about what we're doing in that field on on those websites, which are currently on the screen. Great, thank you, Olivier. Uh, very interesting contribution, obviously, uh, on stewardship, on the lack of leadership. Um, I think for those of you who attended last month's European WBEF webinar, we had uh, a few speakers, including Josefina Lindblom from the European Commission, who is a center person on the levels program that I mentioned. And, and she also mentioned the, the clear importance of embodied carbon, as you just said, and as you said, something that the taxonomy in your opinion is lacking. Uh, you obviously also made a few comments around bonds and green bonds. So uh, I just, before I move on to the next speaker, I, Sean, would you maybe like to uh, react at this point in time? Sure. Great comments, Olivia. Good on you for entering into the debate. I'm going to disagree for a whole lot of things, but you know that anyway. Um, you know, 
are they not helping? There's a lot of debate about additionality versus refi. Is a solar farm less green because it was built two years ago than if it's going to be built next year? I'm going to argue it isn't. And in fact, being able to refinance the solar farm frees up equity, as you say, equity, to be able to build the next solar farm. The bond market's no, no difference. And that's what green bonds are primarily about. They're an equity tool. They're not an additionality tool. You were saying if this was a massive opportunity, we'd be rushing into it. Damned right. I'm sorry. And we're not, we're not, rushing, we're not rushing into it. And that's the difficulty of energy efficiency. That's one of the reasons the, the, of the sorts of measures to try and develop a, a new approach to how to do this in the absence of significant change. But you're perfectly correct, is that there is no certainty about what routes are going to work going forward. This is an attempt to catalyze capital flowing. It's understanding and making visible what is currently green in the context of the solar farm already built is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it is tied, you're perfectly correct, to a broader theory of change, not expecting that the actual instrument itself will deliver a silver bullet change. That's not the point. It's the flow and effect and all the other measures that do it. My last point is we are actually seeing preferencing pricing. The study you mentioned about pricing for green bonds is out of date and, and not right. I refer you to the pricing studies on our website or the German government's announcements about this um, to do it. The question is about embodied carbon. Great question. I'd love to have a longer conversation for it. The Commission did decide the data points weren't there. I appreciate you disagree. We have always signalled that we wanted to bring in more embodied carbon measures into the standard going forward, which we intend to do going forward, but the Commission has to agree the data points are available. So let's keep talking. Thank you for the response. Just a very quick follow-up as we've received a question from uh, please elaborate what you mean when you say the life cycle analysis of a building is not relevant. Thank you. So maybe just a quick response to that. So, so basically what the taxonomy says, it says that you need to do a life cycle analysis, but it doesn't say what the result of that life cycle analysis need to be. And it just says that you need to disclose that life cycle analysis to somebody who is buying the building. But, but it, so basically you just need to do a study which costs like 1,500 euro to do. Uh, to be able to sell like a, a 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 million euro building. So, you know, there, there is basically no consequence uh, and no no need apart that, you know, you need to tick the box and have the life cycle analysis. Uh, I'm also glad I learned today is that bond and equity are the same thing because that's clearly something I was not aware of. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. So moving on, finally, Ella, uh, we've heard from experts in the bonds, banking and investing industries. Uh, as mentioned at the start, you have been part of a study on ESG trends in real estate investment and you know you advise both public and private sector uh, on sustainability. So please, can you share with us the main findings of your study? Yes, thanks, Sander, and um, and really interesting um, interventions uh, previously. So I'd like to offer a different um, a different perspective uh, today, complementary to to what we've just heard, um, which um, was about green bonds for the for the property market. So looking at listed um, assets, I'd like to have to take a look at sustainable finance applied to real estate from a non listed perspective, and that's what we do at Green Salus. As you mentioned, we're a sustainable consulting firm and we've got a very strong expertise with regards to sustainable finance um, on non-listed assets real assets being real estate and infrastructure as well as private um, as well as private equity and um, last May we published the first study uh, with regards to ESG trends um, in real estate investment together with the leading uh, research institute IIF in France and in partnership with um, partner organizations all across Europe um, the two main organisations being INREV uh, and EPRA, um, as well as um, the other organisations that you see below, representative of the main um, European um, markets. Um, so I'd like to highlight a few insights today about um, the study. There's a lot in this study. It's a 48-page um, study, and, and feel free to download it. It's publicly available on our website. Um, and with regards to uh, with regards to um, the scope of the study, maybe we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, 
uh, so as, as mentioned, this is a study that we carried out with 10, uh, with 10 partners, um, 90, over 90 real estate market players were surveyed. We conducted 25 high level interviews and our study covers uh, around close to 800 billion euros of real estate assets under management. So AUM, um, AUMs um, in uh, real estate um, investment. You've got a, an idea of the of the organisations here on the right as well. Moving on to the next slide, um, uh, in terms of the always uh, still on the scope of the study, uh, 15 European countries um, um, covered uh, in the study, and we've got three types uh, of respondents, fund managers, institutional investors, and property companies. And I think it's important to have an idea of what it is, um, um, of what the sustainable investment in real assets looks like uh, on the ground to um, follow up from what uh, Olivier uh, was mentioning um, before, and uh, this perspective on um, with regards to non-listed um, investment is, uh, is key. Um, on the next slide, um, uh, I'd like to give you an idea of what um, came out in, in the study with regards to challenges for ESG um, integration. Uh, complexity of processes um, amongst these players is the main challenge across regions. But if you look carefully at this slide, you'll notice that the lack of normative frameworks um, was a key challenge um, mentioned uh, by real estate players across markets, uh, as well as a, uh, as well as a lack of consistency between national and EU um, regulations. I think it's really important to um, to stress here that um, for those who know of um, real estate and and um, construction, we're looking at very locally. Um, at very local markets. So it's, it's, it's really important when um, looking um, at EU regulations that the link with the national and the local level um, here is key for players to actually uh, you know, drive ESG uh, integration and um, sustainability. So those, those two, um, those two um, challenges um, were, were key and came out in the study. Uh, on the next slide, um, we, I, I give you an, uh, an overview of the drivers for ESG integration that came out in the study. Um, investor demand is the leading driver for ESG integration in Europe, followed by lowering risk. But we've also got um, compliance with existing or anticipated European government policy, which came out as a very strong um, driver uh, in the German um, in the German market. And uh, in terms of um, uh, a third key driver, compliance with existing or anticipated local government policy um, is key as well. Um, and if you're looking at um, uh, existing and anticipated local government policy, you're obviously looking at also um, the dec uh, um, of how European regula regulations were declined locally. So this is also a link to European um, regulations where we see it um, coming into um, real estate players' considerations in terms of drivers for ESG. Uh, on the next slide, um, please. Yes, um, I wanted to give you an idea of prospective ESG trends for real estate investment because I think this is uh, this is particularly um, interesting. Regulations um, are considered by real estate players in the non-listed um, investment environment as key drivers. Um, for sustainable best practices within the real estate sector. And the key challenges that came up um, amongst our um, amongst the, the players that were um, surveyed are the following. Um, uh, a key challenge is harmonisation and convergence between local and European regulation frameworks. I um, mean, it's one thing to look at European regulations, but we need um, those regulations to really be applicable on the ground, nationally and locally. Um, the time and human resources to meet the increasing reporting requirements. Uh, increasing regulations mean, in, means increasing reporting and adaptation on the ground for that reporting to happen. Um, so that's also a, a, a key challenge that was mentioned. Educational work with legislators to explain the specificities of real estate compared to other to other asset classes is also key. Um, the technical expert group um, is obviously one group um, uh, of uh, stakeholder dialogue with uh, legislators working on technical criteria. Um, but 
um, uh, ec uh, economic sectors have their specificities and um, real estate being um, having this underlying real asset specificity um, also needs to be understood. It's not exactly the same as other um, listed assets uh, and that's also key um, to take into account. Um, promote a pr uh, positive vision of um, regulations as um, um, creating incentives um, rather than constraints and that's something that's still um, not quite uh, not quite there yet for um, uh, real estate players on the ground and um, another key um, challenge specific to real estate is the focus uh, is a focus of the regulation on the existing stock that is still uh, insufficient according to real estate players on the next slide um, I, I wanted to, to um, give you a focus on the European taxonomy. I'm not going to go into the detail of the European taxonomy. Uh, it's already been mentioned. Um, but there are different levels of understanding and expectations towards the European taxonomy um, um, that was expressed um, by um, real estate players. 58% of our respondents have started preparing for the European taxonomy, which is a, um, a pretty good and encouraging figure. And there is a consensus among the market players that the European taxonomy will move the real estate sector forward by defining a single market standard and a unified uh, approach. Uh, Sean mentioned earlier on that one of the key questions is what is a green building? That is obviously um, a key, key question. And then when you're looking um, at having a market dynamic, you need um, market standards and unified approaches. And again, as real estate is a local um, uh, is a local um, market, um, that is obviously a, a key challenge. The main limitations of the European taxonomy uh, expressed by real estate players uh, as of um, February 2021 um, was that the European taxonomy focuses on energy um, rather than carbon and does not take into account the entire life cycle of the building. It focuses on the financing of new buildings and not on existing buildings uh, and the existing stock is the key challenge um, with regards to European real estate markets. Uh, it imposes excessively high requirements and little incentive. That would be, that would be something that um, um, expected by um, real estate players is to go towards a more um, incentive driven regula regulatory framework rather than um, a requirement framework and its application varies according um, to local legislation that obviously um, drives uh, challenges with regards to comparability between um, markets. You have on the, on, the, on the graph here on the left uh, an idea of how uh, real estate players um, consider um, their understanding of the European taxonomy. Um, you know, a very good understanding is still uh, pretty poor in terms of figures, you know, only 2.5% of respondents would say they've got a very good understanding of the taxonomy. Um, we've got 266 saying they've got a good um, understanding, but still 27.8% saying they've got a poor understanding. So there's, there's a lot of uh, communication and education also um, to provide with regards to, to the taxonomy uh, to make sure that it gets through to the players on the ground who are actually developing and managing um, uh, real estate and the assets in uh, their funds and from a property company um, perspective. On the next slide please. Um, with regards to um, moving forward um, uh, looking at prospective ESG trends, I just wanted to um, give you also a, a, a look at the other key challenges that the respondents um, uh, stressed, reducing embedded carbon, achieving carbon sobriety by 2050, renovation of the existing real estate stock and stringent regulation and harmonisation at European level. Um, we, we, we've talked about um, European regulations, but I would also stress that there are um, extreme, uh, very positive European initiatives um, the uh, um, European, um, the F uh, Efficient Mortgage uh, Initiative that Jennifer uh, mentioned is one of those. Uh, and then obviously initiatives with regards to decarbonisation um, solutions, passive solutions, um, looking forward to an efficient carbon tax, which is um, heading our way. Um, and the EU funded research project CREM with regards to calculating carbon is also one to look out for, as well as the net zero carbon um, building um, framework. I've, 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 I've got just a few, two, two more minutes um, with regards to uh, my presentation and then I'll be, um, I'll be done. Just the next slide please, um, which is my final, final, final slide. Um, just to um, move, move um, a final word with regards to these key um, challenges from real estate players perspective. Um, 
there are lots of different frameworks with different expectations, especially reporting frameworks. Uh, we mentioned data. Data may be available, but there is um, still um, a lot of heterogeneous uh, quality, reliability, completeness, consistency and comparability of that data, even though it may be available and that's still a key um, challenge and there's still a need for clear guidelines from the regulator. As um, uh, Sanda mentioned earlier on, I mean, we've got so many different, um, um, in, um, di um, I don't know what to call them, not exactly directives, but um, uh, guidelines um, from a regulatory perspective that it's not very, it's not easy for the markets to get a clear understanding of what necessarily needs to be uh, done um, fast. And in terms of initiatives, uh, where does that, where does that take us? Um, that takes us to a place where environmental data collection policy is key and that needs to be worked on, working with counterparties to ensure the reliability of the data, because it's one thing again, to have the data, but reliable data is key uh, with regards to reporting real-time data systems and big data technologies. We need more investment in those uh, in those systems, and obviously also looking at uh, bringing together um, sustainability and um, digital technology um, when 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 looking at real assets. Uh, and that's you know the whole uh, dynamic um, along uh, alongside BIM and the digital twin. Um, of the building. Um, those were just a few insights with regards to our study. There's a lot more in there, um, especially um, looking at ESG policies uh, from fund managers' perspectives, property companies' perspectives. Again, the full study is um, available online as well as in a snapshot, an executive summary. And you can also um, get a look at our replay of the international uh, webinar that took place um, on May 6th. That's it from me, Sander. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Ella. And I do apologize for not giving you sufficient time. That's just some poor time management on my part. But the well, discussion has been very interesting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, with a few diverging views, but but we all want the same thing. So, yeah, I'll I'll just immediately move on because I'm also conscious to all the listeners that we've um, that we've run out of time. Uh, again, but thank thank you, Ella, for that presentation. I, I, what I've taken away as well are a lot of details, including the taxonomy, not taking into account the life cycle of the building, which relates to the embodied carbon comments that were made before. Uh, you also linked it back to Sean and to you know, what is a green building. And as our ICS, but also just me as a person, I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for definitions and, 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 and truly understanding that we're talking about the same thing, which counts for a green building, but it equally counts for net zero and how we measure that. So and I, I do think some questions around that uh, remain, but we're currently on on the right track. Um, so this brings us towards the end of the webinar. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you panelists again and, and also Gloden for sponsoring. Um, I hope everybody listening learned a thing or two. I certainly did. From what I've heard in the diverging views, uh, on which we could do a lot of follow-ups, which we may do in, in, in forthcoming webinars, uh, the EU is leading through all the initiatives and especially through the taxonomy, uh, but it will need to create incentives rather than constraints, to, to quote you, Ella, and, and it should probably take into account more the whole building life cycle than it is now. Um, yeah, I will leave it at that. What I will say is that uh, we will publish a recording of this webinar, including the slides and a written summary, which should be online uh, on our World Built Environment Forum website at the start of uh, next week. Um, so I hope you will all take a look at that and forward it to anybody whom you think to whom this is of interest. Um, and I would also like to have a few final slides in showing you what's in store for the World Built Environment Forum in the coming months. Um, we have a few upcoming webinars. Here are the titles. You could go to rics.org wbef forward slash wbef webinars and register to any of these, which are free of charge, just as this one was. Um, also, uh, following next slide, please. We have, um, as we've heard, you know, the the demand for environmental, social, and governance efforts increase. Uh, ESG and organizations need to understand how this impacts on. Um, we can help organizations become more knowledgeable on this uh, through our communities and training and development packages. If you're interested in this, uh, you can talk to my colleague Smita, whose email address is on this slide. S Padihar at rics.org for further details or contact myself uh, if this is going too quickly and I'm happy to refer you. 
Um, next to these webinars and, and, and our online presence, we have a yearly uh, live summit, which we want to start again, COVID permitting, obviously, next year in January in uh, Dubai. The program will focus on the livable city, agile, healthy and resilient. And you can book your ticket uh, at a super early bird rate uh, at the site you see there. Um, so I would also once again like to thank A-Site, who is the world's built in the, the world built environment forums lead tech partner um next to our site you can also follow us on twitter instagram and linkedin and on our site you can also uh access any past webinars that we've had and finally if you're not tired of everything on social media you can also download our app on the app store and google play uh, where you can find everything that i have just shared so with this thank you again for listening Thank you to the speakers, and I look forward to seeing you present at one of our next webinars. Thank you.